Welcome, everyone. My name is Cindy Weinstein. I'm the Eli and Edith Broad Professor of English, in addition to being Vice Provost and Chief Diversity Officer. I want to thank everyone for joining this webinar, Shoot for the Stars, in celebration of International Women's Day. Nearly 40% of you who are listening to this webinar are graduate students. You comprise the largest group of people listening to the wisdom that will be provided by the seasoned female professionals and Caltech trustees that we are so fortunate to have talk to us today. We're gonna to hear about their career experiences and they're going to offer advice regarding career paths ahead. And with that, what I would like to do is introduce the moderator, Debbie McWinney. Deborah McWinney spent her career in business, largely at the intersection of global financial services and emerging technology. But don't call her a banker. She is a person who led innovation, resulting in some of the major conveniences we enjoy today. She was instrumental in getting ATMs to work globally, introducing debit cards in the US and the development of Apple Pay and Google Wallet. In retirement, she serves on boards of companies, utilizing her experience in business to drive their strategic success. She was the first woman to simultaneously serve on boards of the four largest stock exchanges, the German DAX, the UK FTSE, the New York Stock Exchange, and NASDAQ. She's an accomplished needle pointer, which she claims is her therapy. Currently, Debbie is spending more time as a delighted new grandparent than anything else. Her philosophy of life is, quote, yesterday dinosaurs walked on earth, today let's focus on the future, unquote. Clearly, she strives for constant improvement. Deborah McWinney joined the board of Caltech in 2007, and she is currently the chair of the Student Experience Committee and in that role passionately tries to enhance any program that helps Caltech students achieve their dreams. And today is just one example, and we are so grateful for the work Debbie has done in bringing us all together. Thank you, Debbie. Thanks, Cindy, that was really nice. So I'm just honored to have this panel tonight and you guys sent in so many questions. We're gonna to try to get as many as we can, but first I wanna start the introductions of our panel. I get to introduce Barbara Barrett. Barbara is ridiculous. Here's a sampling of her career. Most recently, she was Secretary of the Air Force, including the new Space Force. She was the ambassador to Finland. She's an attorney, a diplomat, former president of Thunderbird School of Global Management, a CEO, a businesswoman, a pilot, and an equestrian. So all of us would agree that that would be successful. When we talk about career peaks and valleys, Barbara's peaks take her to the extreme. Her peaks include climbing to Africa's highest peak, Carol Manjaro. Her valley is 1,000 feet below the sea in a submersible. From Antarctica in the south to far above the Arctic Circle in Greenland, she's seen it all. She was is an instrument rated pilot. And in 2009, she qualified to go into space after training in Russia, Houston, and Kazakhstan. I hope she keeps her feet on the ground because we need her at Caltech. But since I'm from Montana, my personal favorite is that Barbara and her husband, Craig, own the Triple Creek Guest Ranch, a Montana highway, hideaway that is ranked the number one hotel by Travel and Leisure Magazine and Business Insider. Barbara, thank you for being part of this panel. Well, thank you, Debbie. I'm delighted to be a part of this panel. And, and I have to say that, well, now we're really in for a treat. I have the privilege of introducing Dr. Janet Campagna. She is one of those people who has been good at everything she's ever tried. And well, she's tried about everything. She studied architecture, then theater technology and design, then economics, then statistics, then eco, uh, econometrics, and also political redistricting. In academia, 
In business, big and small, and in government, Dr. Campagna excelled. Instead of the academic career that she had visioned, the week she turned in her dissertation, she got recruited by an asset management firm that needed research. So serendipity launched her 30-year career in the higher paying asset management field, which included stints with Barclays and Deutsche Bank in Los Angeles, San Francisco, and New York City. Unsurprisingly, along the line, she was the sole woman in professional leadership roles, but she proved her worth with numbers. She grew the quant business 100 fold to $100 billion. In 2010, she spun out her business, which she ran until selling it just last year. Raised by a single mom, her family is important to her. So she selected a Caltech alum husband and she mothers a Caltech grad student daughter from being a 17 year old dropout to the recipient of Caltech's Distinguished Alum Award, Dr. Campagna has sa sampled diversity in life. She joins us from her home in Maine, where she uses Caltech precision these days while baking lots of bread. Janet. Thanks, Barbara. Um, I, I think I'm extremely honored. I, I don't think I know, I'm really honored to be on this panel and uh, really am particularly thrilled to be able to introduce another panelist, uh, Dr. Francis Cordova. Uh, Francis is a pretty amazing woman. Um, and I believe that she'll be an inspiration to those of you who are watching us today. She came back onto the board or came onto the board of trustees when she finished her six year stint uh, heading up the NSF. The Francis's life has been full of firsts. The very beginning is when she was born in Paris and she was the first of 12 children. <laughs> I think that set the tone and she just continued on that string of firsts, including at the NSF being the first person in over 30 years to have finished the full six year term. She was the first woman and the youngest chief scientist at NASA. She was the first female president of Purdue. Again, too many firsts to list. She's also one of the most positive people I've gotten to meet in a really long while. And despite all of her incredible credentials, what I found most inspiring, and I think based on some of the questions we've seen, many of you will find this really interesting, that her path to being a woman scientist was not a straight one, uh, certainly not one that many would expect. She studied at Stanford doing her bachelor's degree in English and did anthropological studies in Mexico. Then she asked herself, what do I wanna be when I grow up? And she answered, a physicist. She got a job at Caltech working in computing and then taking advantage of being able to audit classes, being member of staff. She impressed the faculty so much that they accepted her into the doctorate program in physics, which she completed in 1979. So certainly not a straightforward path to being the incredible scientist that she's known for being today. She also regularly says that her time being a grad student at Caltech is one of the best in her life. But some of her current bests include her family, including her grandchildren and her great love of the outdoors where she does many things, including rock climbing, but also traveling the world, looking at the stars. It's great to see you, Francis. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janet. That was just a really nice, nice introduction. I'm, I'm honored to be with you, with all the women on this panel. It's, uh, I'm, I'm honored to be back at Caltech. It was, as you said, it was a, a very, very special time in my life. I have the honor of introducing uh, uh, trustee Anne Stibler Johnson. And Anne, hello. Caltech students will be happy to know that 
Anne graduated from Caltech with a BS and an MS in electrical engineering in 1999 and 2000. She is the youngest woman on the Caltech Board of Trustees. And she is vice chair of the Student Experience Committee of the Caltech Board. Anne is the founding CEO of Scuba Analytics, which processes the world's largest user data sets, including every click on Microsoft Bing and every remote press for Comcast. It used to be called Interana, which described itself as the leader in behavioral analytics for the digital economy and was formed in 2012. And students, that field and that um, kind of position, kind of company did not exist when I was a student. So it just shows you that you can't plan too far ahead because there are all sorts of wonderful things that are going to be created and maybe you'll be creating them yourselves. Anne's company provides a self-service behavioral analytics solution that seeks to help every employee across an organization explore the digital behavior patterns of people and things in order to make well-informed business decisions. Anne was voted one of the San Francisco Bay Area's most influential women in 2015. And she was profiled by Forbes magazine on thought leaders changing the business landscape. Here's a fun fact about Anne. She's currently building out an organic ranch on the California coast in Pescadero, California with her husband who is also a Caltech alum and her twin 14 year olds. Welcome to the panel, Anne Johnson. Thank you so much, friends. Um, I'm excited to be here today. Uh, I love talking to Caltech, uh, Caltech women in particular. Um, and I have the pleasure of introducing my friend, um, Mitch Matthews. And um, some fun things about Mitch uh, is she joined Microsoft when it was only 500 people, slightly smaller than it is today, uh, and went on to become the highest uh, ranking woman at Microsoft and reported to Bill Gates for 22 years. Um, she built the technology brands, uh, Windows, Office, Xbox, and Bing, some of which you might recognize because of great marketing. And she led Microsoft's marketing department of 7,000 marketers with a budget of $5.5 billion. Um, as if that wasn't enough. She uh, left the company in 2012 and now spends her time investing in technology and um, my personal favorite, uh, cannabis. Um, she serves on the board of Wendy's and the UCLA uh, Film and Television School and three private companies. One of which is a 100 acre cannabis farm in Jamaica where she's helping create high-end uh, cannabis consumer products. And I've seen some of her uh, labels and marketing and it is very fancy. <laughs> Um, she also has two children in their her 20s and a two-year-old at home named Quinn, who brings her endless joy. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here with this stellar group of women and, and excited to answer your questions. Hello, and I, could I have all of our panelists come, come back? Well, you know, in my mind, you've already heard a takeaway that I would suggest all of you write down. And France said, you can't plan too far into the future because of how quickly the world is changing. And I think that is a really important um, takeaway. And I think it's certainly emblematic of many of our careers. You know, the, the world changes so much faster than it did, you know, 30 or 40 years ago. And, and um, you know, that's, that's a, something that you can, you can really harvest. So like I said, we, we probably have over 60 questions um, so I'm going to try to consolidate them and answer as many in a broad way as possible. So first, Mitch, I'm going to pass um, one to you. And it's um, one of the most common questions that, that we were asked is, how do you balance um, work and life? What's your advice um, to help this accomplished audience? Uh, great question. Um, the way I think about it is a little different. I, I think it's just called life. 
rather than work-life balance. And you need to figure out what kind of life you want to lead. And we're all going to have different point of views on what feels right for us individually. I think hopefully the choice that you make on your career, it's going to be something that you genuinely enjoy doing. And you're not mentally sitting there saying to yourself, oh, this job is getting in the way of me spending time with my family or getting in the way of my hobbies. It just becomes an extension of the life you are carving out for yourself. And hopefully you're having fun and learning as you progress. Now that said, with any career, there's going to be intense times when you are perhaps spending more time in the office, you're traveling, late nights getting stuff done. And, and frankly, for me, I just think that's a reality of the world of business. And then there are going to be other times when perhaps the workload isn't as burdensome, you get that luxury of more downtime. So in my experience, it really has been a teeter-totter. Yeah, there are extreme times, but there are also other times when it's not. But I think it's important that you have your eyes wide open, that you will need to make trade-offs. And if you want that promotion, if you want that new assignment, if you want to get noticed and get that bigger bonus, there really are times where your workload may be completely out of whack with a normal schedule. But, you know, these are trade-offs that you're either going to say, yeah, that's right for me. I'm willing to make that sacrifice right now because I do want to advance my career. Well, conversely, you may not feel the same way about advancing your career at the expense of other things in your life. I mean, in my experience, there really is no right answer because we're all wired in different ways. We're going to want different things. The one thing I would say, though, I think it's true no matter what, life is about lieutenants. And you, you we all think that we can be superheroes and do it all ourselves, but you know, if there's stuff that you can outsource, don't beat yourself up about it. Do it. Outsource. Get help. So um, lieutenants is the key lesson for me. Thanks, Mitch. You know, I think that one of the things people don't realize is when you move up the organization, um, you're paid more. And when you're paid more, you can outsource more. Right. And so, you know, being aware of that, which, you know, frankly, men tend to be more be better at that um, than women are, but it's something to keep in mind. And you had a little bit different story. Would you, you know, share what you did? Um, I, my story only, I think, illustrates um, Mitch's point, but I can uh, tell my story of uh, some data points. Um, my career has been very bursty. <laughs> um, I started out um, straight out of my master's degree, going into a rotation program at Intel, where I was doing what I thought um, was the career of my dreams, which is uh, you know, designing semiconductor manufacturing processes. And, um, and I realized that uh, there was so much of my skill set and my personality and things that bring me joy that were missing um, when I was watching uh, spreadsheets for yield data all day. And, um, I decided uh, to leave and try something new. Um, I didn't have the new thing in mind. Um, and uh, it turns out that when my husband's career was entering a new phase and he uh, was very busy and had just gotten to that one next level of having more money. And um, so I decided that this would be the time that I would have kids. And so um, I decided I had, I, actually had trouble. So it took a couple of years. Um, and then uh, when I did have kids, I decided to stay home with them for five years. Well, I decided to stay home with them. And, 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 and five years, I decided I didn't want to stay home with them anymore. But um, <laughs> it was a wonderful time. Um, you know, I couldn't figure out, you know, how to go back to work and not miss some of the things, the developmental milestones that I was really excited about um, seeing. And then when they got to be about five, they just didn't need me. I felt like they felt they didn't need me as much. And um, I ended up deciding I wanted to start a company. And uh, that I was pretty sure I could keep my company kind of a part-time thing. And, um, and I would stay, you know, I would still see my kids a lot. And then the company kind of took off and snowballed and all of a sudden I'd raised all this money and I had all these employees and uh, keeping it part-time, actually even keeping it regular full-time was um, totally not an option. And so um, 
I moved my mom in with me. And so she helped stay. So that she was my lieutenant and, uh, and my husband and I uh, started this company, which ended up taking not just my time, but um, my emotions and my attention and everything. And uh, I did that for about five years until I'm like, wow, who are these kids? <laughs> And I really decided to step back from the company a little bit and spend more time with them when they were in middle school and now in high school. And so um, it's, uh, that was my experience. And I definitely needed the lieutenant and it was definitely the, the teeter totter that Mitch was talking about. And, and I was, you know, I, I call it bursts, but that was my experience. We're just entering high school now. And that's a whole new bag of worms that um, I wasn't expecting. <laughs> And plus COVID where you get to be the teacher. Oh yeah. <laughs> that too. Um, okay. So um, many people ask questions about changing directions during your career. And, and some said they didn't know exactly how you would do that or, um, you know, how, many, how you might navigate through that. And Franz, what would be the advice that you would share? Well, First of all, I, I know very few professional women who have not had career changes. In fact, when I've sat at round tables with women and we've just decided to go around and I'll talk about how we got to where we were, they were full of, full of uh, looked like random walks, but they weren't, weren't quite random. They were inspired by something and went in a different direction. After college, um, I was accepted to graduate school and I just wasn't ready to go back to school yet. So I wanted to do something different. And as an English major, I wrote for a magazine uh, in New York City. And then I went back to California and wrote for the LA Times. And um, But I, I kept asking myself, now, what, what do I really want to be by the time I'm 30? As Janet said, I was asking myself this question. And then I saw a special on TV about neutron stars. And I said, that's, that's just it. I, I want to <laughs> be a physicist. And so I went to um, uh, Caltech, asked for a job in computing. And, and one thing led to another. I took courses and, and I became a graduate student in physics. And um, I've had a lot of career changes after I got my PhD. Uh, I've been in and out of government, serving at different agencies. And, um, and I've been uh, at universities, several universities in different positions. And I, I just think that you have to go where your heart leads you. And that's the way to be happy with your life. There, I think there is time to do everything that you want to do. And you, you shouldn't think that you're running out of time. You should just, um, it, it will take some courage to say yes when opportunity knocks and just to go in that direction, do the best that you can and try to excel at every step of the way. And then other good thing, other doors will open. And so I've, I've never had a strategic plan for life. Uh, some people do, and they do very well with that. And I'm reminded of a, uh, something that Condoleezza Rice said uh, once when she was interviewed about being provost at Stanford. And they said, uh, the interviewer said, did you, uh, was this part of your strategic plan to become provost of Stanford University? She said, oh no, if I had had a strategic plan for my life, I'd be playing the piano at Nordstrom's, which <laughs> That was great. I think so, uh, most of you are too young to know that that was actually a job, was playing the piano at Nordstrom's. They, they don't have that anymore. So um, anyway, that's that's how I think about uh, life's changes. There, there are many changes in store for you. Don't worry about them. Don't look too far ahead. Just look at the next opportunity. If it looks great to you, then take it and do the best you can with it. Barbara, you've probably had the biggest changes. How would you answer that question? Well, I guess uh, it would be hard to chart my career uh, because there have been a lot of twists and turns. But uh, I would say it is a good idea to have some plan or some at least set of values or aspirations, but don't pass up serendipity. Uh, a plan is... Uh, Clausewitz, you know, no plan survives its first contact with the enemy. No, uh, no plan 
in life is likely to survive uh, the realities that come. But it is important to think about what do you care about? What matters? Do you want a family or don't you? Do you want to be close to a geography? Um, and is that going to be important to you? Um, so think about what you're, what are the things that are important to you now and think about the phases that your life might have. So I'd say have a plan or at least think about what your values are, but do not pass up serendipity. Probably the most significant life changes will derive from things, blindsiding things that you never would have seen coming. That certainly was the case with each of the changes in in my career, my checkered career path. Thanks, thanks, Barbara. Um, so one of the things that's really kind of very topical about women in business or women in, in any field is this idea that women suffer from an imposter syndrome. And Janet, what, what do you think about that whole concept of how you feel about how much knowledge you have versus your perception of what you should have? Thanks for throwing that one my way. <laughs> It's a very challenging thing to discuss because the very idea of saying imposter syndrome, I think sets us up in a very negative way. It's not at all clear that the vast majority of people don't feel at times like they're in over their head or that they got what they got, not because they deserved it, but because of some great stroke of luck. And they wondered, they really deserve what they have? Do they really belong there? Do they re are they as smart as everyone else? And interestingly enough, it seems that the highest achieving people suffer from this the most. And it's not at all clear from the data that this is something that only women go through. But at the same time, it's really become this sort of women's issue. There's a lot of strategies out there that are discussed around how you deal with it yourself. And we could talk about all of those, positive reinforcement, reminding yourself that you do have the credentials. But at the same time, I wanted to just bring up that by turning it into something that we call this imposter syndrome and really making it into a women's issue, I don't know that there are many management seminars that are for a broad audience that talk about this, but every women's conference has a seminar on imposter syndrome and it personalizes it. It makes it be your problem that you have this syndrome as opposed to, and, and that when it's your problem, you're supposed to fix it. And I would challenge us to think about maybe the workplace needs to ask itself, why so many women? What sort of messages do they get, particularly women of color? that reinforce this idea that they don't belong there, reinforce people questioning their own credentials. And I think when companies or academic institutions, for example, do um, surveys, uh, they should ask and find out how prevalent is that in their institution? Because I think the institution should look at themselves and say, are we creating an environment where people who are very accomplished can feel good about that and feel that they can succeed in our particular culture? French, you also had some thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I think that uh, Janet is, uh, is a truly wise person. I always love everything she, she comes out with. And I, I think she's right on. I, I, I think that the whole imposter syndrome should be excised from the vocabulary of our meetings and discussions and stuff. I have never felt that I shouldn't be where I was, even when I just knew from the facts that I didn't have the background and experience of some of my peers, because I always knew that I had something that they didn't have. And a, a great example is when I was a Caltech graduate student, I, I didn't have the background in physics, I didn't have a BS, I didn't have, you know, all the way back and stuff. But, but, but I, I, had, I had something that those guys, and they were all guys, 
you know, didn't have, which was passion and interest. And I was committed and, and, and they were dropping like flies, not exactly like flies, but they did drop. <laughs> Some of them did because they had too, too much of that. And they wanted to go off and do something else besides get a physics degree. But um, I, I felt that uh, I had worked hard for wherever I was and somehow I'd gotten there. And so I deserved that spot as much as the next person. And I, I felt that uh, there was a lot of hard work to succeed, but there's always a lot of hard work to succeed. And hard, hard work shouldn't scare us. We, we embrace it. We, we welcome it. So, so out with the imposter syndrome. I agree with Jenna. Great. So um, we had several questions about two income families and, um, you know, kind of how you juggle, what are the roles in, in families as you go forward? Because it's kind of the world is smart people, marry smart people, and, you know, you all have capabilities. Um, you know, I have to say that in over the last probably 25 years of my career, I got very involved in um, all the companies at um kind of managing or being the, you know, the, the lead of women's organizations at Citibank, we did a lot of work, particularly with McKinsey and, um, uh, you know, a couple of the accounting firms that were very concerned about this. And we found that um, over 80% of the senior women, so of course we were on Wall Street, so that's our, our lingo was um, kind of directors and managing directors. And by the time you get to a managing director level, pretty much, the women were the primary breadwinners in the household and roles were adjusted in the household um, accordingly. But um, I can honestly tell you that none of my close friends have husbands who work I, I, in a traditional job. They may do things, but I can honestly tell you that that is a, um, you know, it's just something that we're, that's just the way it is. But Barbara, you have a very different situation. <laughs> um, how have you managed? Well, during our uh, time when Craig, my husband was uh, with Intel Corporation, uh, when we met, we met hiking, we met at the top of a mountain. So it's not like uh, we had a shared interest in, uh, in our professional lives, um, but he was very active uh, as a top, as an executive with Intel. I was the vice president of a company, Fortune 500 company. And uh, so we were both very much working in a corporate environment um, and both of us um, prospered in those in those settings. But at different times, his career would take the lead in that he would have a more challenging time and I would play the support role. There would be occasions when my role was a more challenging one and he would um, take on a stronger support. He would pitch in a lot more than what he would when he was sort of in the lead role. So um, we did have to balance things back and back and forth. But we really made a point of spending really almost devoutly each weekend together and where it was possible to include each other in our travel plans or in our planning, uh, we did engage uh, as much as we could to uh, include each other in in the involvement that that doesn't mean a lot in that it, probably that would mean that maybe quarterly there would be something of intels that I would attend and Craig spent when I was ambassador he spent one week a month in Finland with me um, but if, that was about the amount that he was able to to spend there from away from uh, Intel duties at that point he was chairman of the board. Uh, so it, it does take a balance and it takes a very understanding spouse in both directions, um, but it also is, it requires determining the priority of, of retaining, carving out some time that is sacred to, uh, our, to the relationship and being as supportive as possible in both being sometimes the supported and sometimes the supporter. Okay, Anne? And we, uh, we actually got an interesting question on the Q&A that is related. So um, thinking back to when you were still dating, how did you filter potential partners for the ones that would support your career ambitions? So, you know, back before you're stuck with the one you got now, <laughs> what can you do differently? 
Oh, well, who wants that one? <laughs> I mean, well, I would just say interesting question, isn't it? Yeah. Maybe one of the most important decisions you make in life is who you spend, who you decide to spend your life with. And um, so it, it is really important to determine, again, it's a matter of values and priorities, uh, but uh, you you can weed through the ones that um, either are not, uh, not dedicated to m making some investments and making uh, some trade-offs. Yeah, I think Barbara, you've nailed it there. It's about the shared values. Yeah, but it, it's it's also about just like, I think you have to really decide that it's not going to be most likely like your mom and dad had and that you have to be willing to um, be comfortable, like, you know, mom, we aren't doing it like you and dad, we aren't doing it like you because a lot of the the, you know, problems people have is that their parents think it should be one way or another. And so you have to just like, no, we're, we're going to do this our own way and be really proud of that. Um, uh, yeah, uh, perhaps this is oversharing, but in the spirit of International <laughs> Women's Day, I totally emasculated my first husband. And, uh, you know, and I wasn't cognizant of that. And for some people, he wasn't comfortable with being Mr. Matthews. You know, I didn't take his name. Like, things like that, that, you know, when I mull over it and think about it now, he didn't want to go around and be called Mr. Matthews. He wanted to be called Mr. Sanderson. And so... You know, I, I know, again, I would be far more thoughtful about these things when someone's career is taking off and someone else is, isn't so much. You, 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 you do need to think about those details. Well, I, that is very um, important. I think I may have had that same problem, Mitch. Um, <laughs> <laughs> One thing I've seen in uh, people's around me whose marriages work well in my own is... Um, uh, matched ambition levels. I think when you're both quite ambitious, your understanding of the other person, you know, making choices for their career. Um, I, I see it work well when, you know, two people, you know, have the same. And, it, and then if you have people who's, and I think this goes back to Mitch's original answer and values. Um, if, you know, if you guys are laid back and your, and your, your values are, you know, you want to spend more time on the beach, I think, um, you know, that can be a very happy marriage too. But I think having those things aligned, it, it'd be very hard to have someone with yeah. a lot of ambition and someone without. So I have a question that, um, that I think weaves a lot of the themes and, um, you know, if, if I were, you know, when I listen or when I read in between the lines on some of these questions, it's kind of like, well, how does this serendipity happen? You know, how do you get plucked from one company and then somebody offers you a job doing this and then this? And, you know, a, a lot of it comes down to your reputation. And, um, you know, it's your reputation about how you are as a colleague. It's your reputation as a manager. It's your reputation in making business decisions or whatever decisions, you know, are relevant in your career. But, Honestly, your reputation is everything because um, it can kill you or it can help you. And I think it's really an important, I mean, sh you know, look at the people that are being hurt in social media today. And, you know, because they say something or do something and it'll live with them forever. But who would like to kind of address that reputation element of your career? Don't I'll jump in, France. I'm going to call on you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's, I, I mean, reputation is an important part of it, but it's also how, most of my serendipity has been by, by doing a, just a good job at whatever I was doing at that time. And then somebody noticing it and saying, hmm, you know, like when I was vice chancellor at uh, Santa, UC Santa Barbara, the, the, an opening came for a chancellor at another campus and the, the, uh, the head of the uh, institution, the president of UC says, well, you know, France, uh, are, are you interested in this? I, you know, I think this would be a 
you know, really good thing for you to do in it. And, and that's, that kind of thing has happened to me, Barbara, when we were on the Smithsonian and the other regents who were in, uh, who were congressmen and senators said, because I got the opportunity to chair the board at one point, and they said, hmm, you know, say, we could, we could use you in government. So if you don't mind, we would like to recommend you for to head a science agency over here. So I think that that, that is also an ingredient. Obviously, if your reputation isn't any good, that isn't going to happen. But I think if you are doing a, a good job in, in what you are doing, and then you are in environments where other people notice that, and they, but still, the, the magic word is yes, that when the opportunity comes up, you can't just sort of I, you know, say, mm, well, let me think about it. Say, well, that sounds very interesting. Tell me more. And if I'll, I'll tell the, the students here, especially a story when I was once at Wallops Island, because I, at that time I was with NASA as chief scientist for NASA, I was giving a talk and there was a woman in the audience who, after I spoke, said, raised her hand. And she said, you know, uh, I was looking at your bio and we're the same age and you've done bing, bing, bing. And I'm, I started here and I'm still here. And, um, and I want to know why you have done these things and why I'm still here. And I said, well, have you ever been uh, asked if you'd be interested in going somewhere else or moving to, you know, another position? And she said, well, yes, as, as a matter of fact, I have. And I said, and your response was, and she said, well, there was, um, there was the dog and, uh, and my, my spouse, I wasn't sure if he would go for it. And, and she went on this litany of things that were, she thought might hold her back. And so we had a good talk about it. And I think that, that you have to be um, willing to say yes and I'm, I'm going to check with the people that love me and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to ask them that they would help me, you know, uh, say yes. And Janet has her hand up here. She wants to add to this. You and I always have a good back and forth, <laughs> France, but I, <clears throat> I, I agree with you, but it, as listening to what people are talking about in a lot of these situations, doesn't it really come down to knowing yourself, whether that's your values, your ambitions, what's important to you. Some people may never want to make geographic change and that's, that's fine. Or they may want to live in a specific geography, but you have to be honest with yourself and mm -hmm. know what your own strengths are, know what your own values uh, are. And for example, I know I'm a risk taker. So I was willing to take a new job, move across the country or move in a different part of the country. Not everyone is willing to do that. And it does take um, a very particular kind of person to be willing to do that, to enjoy doing that um, and to handle all of the changes that come from that. And as well, being married to someone, um, if, if you are married, that or have a partner that is also willing to do those kinds of things. But I think it starts with that self-examination, mm -hmm. uh, self-realization, and it's okay not to have, you know, accomplishment after accomplishment in a particular area because you may be focused on accomplishments in other areas. But if you do want those accomplishments, say in your career, then be honest with yourself about what it's gonna to take to do that and whether or not you're willing to take those kinds of risks and in order to seize those opportunities with the understanding that, you know, you're, you're hoping for the best, but um, they don't always, you know, it doesn't, there's no guarantee that it's going to work out. So we've had a couple of questions come in just over the last few minutes about um, moving into management and your first management responsibility. And I just want to say for all of you that are in school, you know, there are a lot of opportunities that you get with clubs or in your house or in graduate school, you know, that are with the clubs and things that where you learn to manage your peers and you learn to work with people under, you know, situations where you all have finals and you all have work due and things like that. Those are beginning management jobs. Those are chances for you to, to learn. And so while you're in school, make sure you're taking advantage of those because then when you get out of school, and there's a management opportunity and somebody says to you, 
have you ever managed? You can say yes, and then give them that example. And it'll be just fine, just fine. You, you will do a great job in your first you know, time as a manager. But you know, I just think a lot of times kids don't realize when you're in school that those are your first learning experiences of a lot of lifelong lessons um, that you're gonna have. But once you are in a management job, then you need to be a leader. And you need to guide people and you need to listen to people. So which one of you would, would like to just talk about the really important um, parts of leadership in your mind, particularly from a management role? Janet? Oh, Mitch, Mitch greened me. <laughs> I, I was going to, so, so this isn't going to directly answer your question, but I do think it's an important element building on what both Janet and Franz said that in my experience that like there's lots of questions on the chat about leadership and how does a woman get noticed and how does she create that moment of truth for the next opportunity and stuff and I know suddenly this is in the corporate world but women generally this is a sweeping generalization I know but women aren't very good at asking for it like asking for the promotion asking for money, making sure that they're showcasing. We, we're doers and we expect people to see that we've done good stuff. Whereas I can tell you, I observed men in the corporate um, world who would absolutely make sure you knew that they had accomplished X or accomplished Y. And it wasn't Machiavellian, it's just the natural thing that they are gonna let everyone know and take ownership for good stuff they've done. Whereas um, I would see a lot of women in the workplace would expect the boss to notice. So I, I think for women, it, it's very important to showcase that. It doesn't have to be this, you know, patting itself on the back, but a carefully crafted email on what they accomplished and why, or building some advocates for them internally who had a coffee with them and knew their work product or what they are skilled and what they are able to accomplish are those things that I think actually do put you on people's radar screen and people are like, oh, I'm willing to take a bet in them in a new job or as a manager or put them in a leadership role because they showed that kind of chutzpah. And I, I think that there's, again, no understanding whether or not, these are things you want to do as well. You know, are you, are you interested in people? Are you interested in management? Are you interested in leadership roles? And being clear with yourself about what that means to you, I think to the point that you just made, Mitch, when I started my, my company, one of the first things we did uh, was to look at how the evaluation system worked. And in doing some surveys and having some small um groups that could get together and discuss what had not worked for them as well as what had worked for them in previous organizations, that exact issue came up. You know, most of these evaluation systems are not very customized. And so, and, you know, how did you um, highlight what you were doing and how you were meeting your goals in ways that really felt um, important and, and real to you? Uh, as opposed to some of these checklists. And so we really worked to develop something where people had this opportunity to put down on paper what they were bringing to the company, what they had accomplished. And it was really meaningful for a lot of the women in our com company. They felt that it was the first time that they had a real way to do that and in a way that they could feel comfortable with, because it was that how do you do it and not be doing this or not be seen as trying to grab credit? And so just allowing people to craft how they wanted to present themselves to their manager and the senior people in the firm made a huge difference. And I think you have to be really careful coming from Caltech because there's this belief that it's, you know, it's all in the proof. You just like you write out the proof and then you can see how smart this person is and they don't need to tell you. And uh, <laughs> it's not at all the case. In, in business, um, there is no proof and no homework and there's no QED, you know, I'm, I'm the one for it. You have to uh, do exactly as they said and um, reinforce and yeah, essentially brag about all the great things you, you do. 
So we've had several questions about um, the fact that we all navigated in male dominated fields. Um, you know, frankly, I felt it was easier to be noticed for doing a good job because I was always the only woman in a room, but um, you know, I, I really think it played to my advantage um, and that I was always the risk taker willing to go out on a limb, you know, clean up a business, start a new business. But how, how do, would you say, is there, because I mean, let's be honest, it's still very, very male dominated, but nonetheless, everybody out there is looking for talented women. So what, what advice would you have about, you know, specifically not shying away from male dominated fields? Barbara, how about you? I mean, you just came off one of the, <laughs> walking around the Pentagon couldn't have been um, all that many women. Yeah, there do seem to be a lot of gentlemen in the uh, in the <laughs> Air Force and the Space Force, but I think it is a decreasing challenge. I think that people are being sought for the quality of what they put into it, and uh, what packaging you come in is, I think, not going to be in the future as as important as it has been in what what some of us saw going into some of those roles. It's not over, but the, the place you want to work is probably going to uh, look for what kind of performance you put in. And if that isn't the kind of focus that the place has, you probably, uh, if, you, if you're a student at Caltech, you have enough to offer that you, sh you have other options and go choose them. Um, so, and I, and I think an important thing is not to, not to be, feel compelled to run with the herd. Don't feel that you have to be what everybody else is doing. Maybe you don't want to be in management. Maybe you like the lab and that your highest and best use is coming up with some great inventions or some uh, great things that are going to solve a problem. We have, we have long been valued. Uh, there's been this push toward if you aren't in management, you aren't moving up. It's really important that we look at people that are contributing in ways other than managing people. A lot more people can manage people than can do some of the technology that the Caltech would specialize in. I'd also just say that there are, there are project people and there are um, maybe a continuity people. Uh, I guess uh, my resume would suggest I'm more on the, on the project basis. I mean, I, I would take something on with the intent to finish it, get it done, do it quickly, um, move on, go do something else, but take it on. So, so going and um, serving at the UN or taking on a, as an acting CEO or um, running something for a while while we sort things out and bring in the, the, the person for continuity, that's something I enjoy doing. For other people, that would be nerve rattling. Um, so so for some, some people are very much the people that have been in a company and have been there for a very long time, the same company. Others uh, move rapidly uh, in di to different places. And that's, that's gonna be a very individual um, selection and, and determined again by values and sometimes uh, family and, and geography and other um, qualities that they, that they prefer and enjoy. I think it about you know five years ago, which is latest I, I have really paid attention to this, there, there's a list called the, the Fortune Most Powerful Women list. And, and um, you know, I think that one of the things that came out on that is how many times the women had changed jobs. I, I, other than the women that started their own companies, virtually everybody had made changes between companies, you know, maybe for our fathers, they stayed at the same company for years, but that just isn't really the reality. And I would argue that, um, that for, for anybody, and I really mean this for anybody, to excel and reach um, the highest levels that they can, they're going to want to change. You just take the best of what you've learned at one company and then move on uh, to another one. But, um, and that's not being disloyal. That's just 
being real and keeping your enthusiasm going about, you know, what you're doing every day is it makes a kind of, of fun. Um, but yeah, I may, I, may I just push back for a moment and say, sure. you can make a lot of change within a company and you can make yeah. a lot of change if you're in a lab and you're, and you're moving through stages of research that I don't want to see that demeaned as a career choice, because I think that some of the best for, uh, for humanity is what we, will dis- what we will find from people that are doing things that are not management focused, but are, are scientifically developed, especially a Caltech uh, capability. Yeah, that's, that's, just, that's fair. Janet? I want to add on to something that, that Barbara said, but I think it's really important, which is it's okay to recognize that maybe a place isn't for you. Right, that if it's, you know, Barbara said, is this in the kind of place you wanna work, you'll be recognized for these kinds of things. And I do think it's, it's okay. You shouldn't um, think I need to make myself fit in here. I'm not suggesting that you just go from place to place whenever you have a problem, but I am saying that finding the kind of environment in which you can be successful is an okay part of your value system and what it is that you're that you're looking for um, to to be in a place where you are able to contribute at at your highest level um, and that's not going to be every single place and it's not going to be the same for each person. I found in my career that there were people who worked with me in B organizations and when we moved to be a smaller company. That wasn't a great environment for them. They needed that larger organizational structure and it worked for them. Um, they could contribute at their best level in a more entrepreneurial, wear more hats kind, kind of company that didn't suit them so much, but others absolutely blossomed in that environment and really you know, just became so enthusiastic about being able to work on you know, different areas and really grow in all those areas. And those are things that we each have to answer for ourselves. And sometimes we only find out when we've jumped into the deep end of the pool and um, find out whether or not we can swim there. So one time when I was just starting out in my job, um, I was in marketing and the, um, the people that headed up the part of the project where I was on were the technology people. And they said, Debbie, we want you to come do a technology job and the technology job was in corporate banking. It had to do with consolidating six letters of credit system. I had no idea what they were talking about. I didn't know what a letter of credit was. And they said, no, you will learn a lot. And we think that you're the right person to do it. Had I said no to a job, talk about like not knowing what I was doing. I mean, I really didn't know what I was doing. But had I said no to that, it would have changed the entire trajectory of my career. Because from then on, I had a reputation of being a really good technology project manager. And when we were integrating companies or whatever, I was like the go-to person, Debbie will figure it out, Debbie will figure it out. Had I not taken that technology job that it took, I really didn't want to do, it would have changed my trajectory. But, but Mitch, I want to ask you a question because, you know, the idea that you started out with Microsoft when it had 500 um, people, and then you left in 2012 and you had a five point something billion dollar marketing budget. If someone would have told young Mitch that you were going to have a five point, I mean, first of all, Microsoft wouldn't have imagined having it when you joined the company, you know, that kind of a job. But, you know, what Barbara's saying, you you can grow in a job. I mean, you are like the ultimate grow in a job. Yeah, I, I, I mean, it was, I was never hired to say, hey, become a CMO, it was, can you do research? Can you do events? Can you do public relations? And then we just kept growing and growing and growing the department. And it was, I mean, in in some senses, I was very blessed because I didn't have to quit and go to another company because our business changed so dramatically. We went from programming languages to operating systems, to phones, to consoles to servers and cloud computing and you know you'd have to quit and go to another company to experience all those things so I was just like 
very, very blessed there. But one thing I, I, I think that hasn't come up yet that I do think is important for everyone on the call is the important, important shit of mentorship. So when you have these little diversions and maybe you don't want to let everyone know that I'm so out of my depth right now running a PL and or running the United States and I hate spreadsheets, but I can't let them all know that, you know, <laughs> and you want to say, yeah, I've got this. But to have someone who's got your back, who is objective, who is not necessarily in your reporting structure, it might not even be in your company, it may be, you know, somewhere outside that. Someone that you can call up and be completely unvarnished and go, help me, what would you do in my situation? Coach me through this so I, so I you know, can come out the other side and look successful. And I think mentors come and go in your life that sometimes you exhaust the relationship with someone or you've learned as much as you can from that person. But I would say to everyone on this call, it's like, it's always great to have someone who is objective that you can call and be completely open and honest about the situation you're in, who is gonna be a truth teller to you, but also at the same time, say you've got it and be your coach. So I wanna take a little bit of a, of a curve. A couple questions have come in about, did you ever have a setback in your career? And how did you deal with it? Anybody want to raise their hand to help me out on that one? I'll start. I'll start. I was um, at a company. I won't name the company. Um, something you've all heard of. And um, a person was put in as the CEO that I had a really difficult time working with. And I just come off having um, breast cancer and just decided life was too short. And I decided, I knew I'd get a job doing something else. And so I stepped away from the company that I dearly love from a job that I dearly loved, but just, you know, just the relationship was not fun. And ironically, it has turned out to be the best thing that could have happened to me from a career standpoint, um, financially, everything. It, it really put me on an entirely different course. Who else is, wants to share a tough moment? Well, I'll, I'll just say that, um, uh, that you said that it was a person that, Debbie, that was really in your way, okay, that you didn't get along with, that made you do a change, right? And my experience has been is that, 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 that there is no challenge as big as people challenges. And the, 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 the lowest points in one's life can be, be because of somebody that is not being helpful um, and being the opposite, uh, but not, not because you're faced with, you know, launching a, a satellite or something like that. Those, those are easy compared. And so, so I've learned the following because that, that's happened to me, you know, just once or twice in my life that somebody was not just definitely not only not on my side but mm, making making life really hard for me to uh maintain and advance and so forth and so i my immediate reaction is just to you know move in a different uh not fight it just move in a different direction keep doing a job well and and be with other people who are supportive but wh what i what i've learned is that that life catches up with those if if somebody is is negative towards you and not helpful and you know mean then they they're going to be mean to the wrong the wrong person who does fight back eventually and that's what's what i've always experienced it's that before you know it, that person is just gone uh, because they're they're just not getting along. It's not you. It's not something that you're taking personally. It's that they don't just get along with anybody. And and so and then that barrier is removed, and then you can expand and uh, blossom. So I, I just want to mention that because so many times young people, young women, ask me about 
about that, that they're just having trouble with someone. And, and, and I'm sure that a lot of people on this panel have techniques for fighting back, but if you don't, as, as I didn't, when that happened to me a long time ago, they, they, they do, you know, find their own um, nemesis and <laughs> get taken away. So, yeah. So we don't want to get, oh, did somebody else want to, Barbara? I, mean, I would just say quickly that in a career, every one of us is going to run into some people who just don't have, uh, that just aren't the people you want to work with, or that, that we're all going to run into somebody along the way that is not helpful or who just doesn't see the world with the same set of values or someone that you, um, that you, whatever your values of integrity or uh, leadership might be that uh, someone who is non-productive. Learning how to deal with that is one of those early lessons in life. And the sooner you, you run into it and start thinking about what are my tools? How do I go about this? Um, who are my allies? Now, it has often been said about women that we are collaborative in our leadership style and that we... Um, some, some research has been done that demonstrates that minorities behave in a collaborative style because otherwise they get outvoted. Um, and that, that forming alliances, working with other people is how a, a woman or an underdog uh, is going to be successful. And so early on, uh, it's important to figure out what your tools are, what your techniques are and what you're willing to tolerate um, in the process of dealing with opposition or, or uh, some adverse conditions. And that adverse condition can be uh, a colleague or a superior or a, uh, or a competitor that, um, that is hard to deal with for one reason or another. But my point is, it's just a rite of passage. You're gonna go through that, you figure it out and you move on. Yep. And, you know, don't be afraid to close one door and open another one. Don't just don't don't let that scare you. You'd be surprised. So a couple of questions came in, I think, are, are really interesting about, you know, how do you work um, when you aren't the formal leader? Or, you know, what how do you influence other people? And, you know, life, you go to a company, everything is matrix organization. And, you know, you have to work with everyone. So which, which ones of you would want to, you know, kind of give your thoughts on that? Because that, again, is just a life lesson in everything you do. I know that, you know, in managing a company or managing a, a large team, <laughs> one of the biggest challenges were, was, were the people that came to me with that question all the time. You know, how can I... I don't have power over this, or I don't have control over that, or I, um, I need more authority in order to be able to achieve this goal. And I really tried to coach people to understand that nobody has that level of authority. You can be the CEO of the company, you don't just get to make unilateral decisions, or if you do, probably gonna end up like the people Francis is talking about, that that will come back on you um, at some point. So getting people to understand that it's not power and you know authority that allows you to make change or to get things done, but it is working collaboratively. It is building up those alliances, getting people to believe in you and what it is you're trying to, to do, as opposed to trying to um, thinking that if you could just tell every single person what they needed to do, that it would all get done. And um, that maybe that is the definition of collaborative leadership and maybe that isn't the way that everybody works, but I did find that it was a very helpful lesson for a lot of people to learn. Don't assume that you have to be the boss or in charge in order to be a really productive, influential person. And the more you show that positive side and come with solutions as opposed to only pointing out the problems, the more valuable you'll become to an organization and to your colleagues, and you will naturally become an influencer. 
Yeah, and all of us have had experiences with people that might work for us that really fill that role. Maybe they, they just have a super skill set and they're really good at doing that. And personally, I've considered them more my mentors than maybe somebody way up there that I you know, can't see or whatever. That, but you just, uh, people come with some extraordinary skill sets and people skills and all, and they can come in all different levels of the organization and they contribute so much by keeping this collaborative thing and uh, being able to, uh, when there's uh, challenges that arise between people or organizations, be able, they're, they're, they're just natural fixers and they're just amazing amazing people. I've had some chiefs of staff that were extraordinary and I learned so much and I appreciate so much their, their skill set because it really keeps the organization together. So we have a question of questions that I, you know, as we're, you know, after nine o'clock, I want to um, get to a couple things where we can um, be, turn on our inspirational selves. Um, if someone gave you a piece of advice that you would want to have had while you were in college, what would it be? Well, I would just say that I would have done well to have uh, thought bigger uh, in college. I did not, I, my aspiration was to get a check, pay the bills. And I, I would not have aspired to any of the lineup of, of uh, work I've had the privilege of doing. Had, and had I done a bit more in preparation to, for um, higher aspirations, maybe I uh, would have been better prepared. Thanks, Barbara. And you had your hand up. Yeah. Um, for me, I spent a lot of time just thinking about um, having enough money. Uh, I really wanted to have a career that gave me a steady income. And, um, and I don't think I was thinking, like Barbara said, uh, big enough. But I think what I wish I would have done was looked inside myself and figured out, to quote Marie Kondo, what sparks joy for me. Um, and realizing that it's not just um, the field, but also what you spend your time during that career doing. So um, if you really love to be with people, um, that's a completely different career than someone who really likes to build something on their own or design something and then, you know, come out with it. Um, so the advice I would give to, to my younger self is pay attention um, to, to really what sparks joy for you and not just think about the paycheck. Mitch? I would say um, when, when you're at school, you don't realize what you're good at and what you're not. And I think the sooner you get that, the happier in life you're going to be because you will make decisions and career choices on things that you excel at as opposed to things that you think you should do. And I think there's three categories. There's stuff that you are really crap at and you're never gonna be good in your life and you should just give it up and just know you're always gonna get <laughs> C on that. And those are the people you hire who compensate for you in that. Mm -hmm. Then you've got stuff that maybe is your life's work at getting better at those things. But maybe you'll get a B, maybe a B plus. And these are your people that mentor you, help you, it's your reading list by the side of your bed. You know, it's a life's work. And then there's the category of things that, boy, you ace that. That is you. You are really good at those things. And when you figure out that category, I mean, that's when you're cooking on gas. You're getting the promotion. You're taking jobs. You're surrounding with your people. And it becomes this self-fulfilling prophecy. And I wish someone had told me stuff like that back then or told me, get your act together to figure those things out. Start holding the mirror up to yourself. Yeah, I, I, when somebody um, that was talking to me one time and I just thought, you know, too many people create their own glass ceiling, you know, by not taking a class that, you know, takes them in a different direction or not learning to do public speaking because they're afraid of it in junior high school or something like that. And, you know, just don't create your own glass ceiling, you know, just keep those options open, keep as many options open as you possibly can. 
And a cool thing to do is just ask someone who knows you well, what you're good at. <laughs> like, it, I think it's oftentimes really hard for you to see, but say, hey, what's my superpower, you know? Because um, you're oftentimes true. just assume that everybody else is really bad at what you're good at and not that you're a special or anything. And, and I would add, don't let people tell you that you're too young to do something or you're too old to do it or you're too this or you're too that because if it's your dream and your passion, you should just do it. I mean, look at, you know, those uh, two astronauts that I, I mentioned in our pre-session that were married and had a little baby and traded time on the space station. I mean, you know, I, I, people could have said, you, you can't, you can't do that. You know, first of all, don't marry somebody like that, like yourself, and then don't have a baby and think you can go spend six months on the space station. But there are so many times when, um, when we've all been told that we're just, you know, that, that this, this dream is not for us. And with me, it started in, in high school when I had dreams of being a scientist and my parents and teachers said, you know, women don't do that. You have to go to this ugly thing called graduate school and, and you, you know, you, you won't find a husband and, you know, all, all these kind of things. That was the generation I grew up in and, and that wasn't true. And then when I was in graduate school, I wanted to run the Boston Marathon. People said, oh, no, you're too old. The people who run the Boston Marathon are 20 or something. But I ran it anyway, and I finished. <laughs> Yay! No, it time, but I finished. So I, I just, just think you just can't, you know, I, I think it's great what Anne just said, that there are people who will recognize what you're good at. And they're usually called mom, you know, or some, you know, your very best friend. But there are a lot of people that just have biases and prejudices about what, what uh, anybody can achieve. And you, you can achieve what you set your mind to. So I'm gonna do one more question. Um, what is the best advice you've ever received? So I actually um, got really good advice from De you, Debbie. <laughs> and um, one of the things you said was that, I, I, I want you to tell the story, but that you uh, were never actually promoted. That every time that you went up in your career, it was uh, a job that you defined. Could you elaborate? Oh yeah, that's, that's true. I, I, every job I ever had was a new job. And it was just something that someone created for me um, and, you know, go solve a problem, go do this or go do that. But I look back on my career and went, oh my gosh, uh, you know, that was, that was my whole career and how fortunate I was because I got to put together teams and I got to set goals and hit the goals and, <laughs> um, you know, it was just great. And, um, and I loved it, but, you know, like Barbara and Mish said, you know, like I, I, I love living on the edge. You know, if you gave me a standard operation to run, you know, and said, go run it as the, one of our uh, trustees, a guy named Dick Rosenberg came before you know, all of us. And he was my boss, my boss's boss's boss. And he, but he called me one day and he says, Debbie, I am never giving you a standard operation to run. He said, you know how to make us money and you know how to fix things. I've got like two of you and 500 of the other people. <laughs> But that was that was my career, and I loved it. No, I think, but I think Sam, the idea that you can you, that you can you know shape. You don't need to wait for you to fit in a slot that's already there. Yeah. Who other? Uh, who else would want to weigh in on that? Okay, yes, that one, if, um, you know, it, I think advice and what, what I would say, just to close that off, how important um, getting feedback from people is, you know, when, when you, if you have a mentor or if you have someone who is, you know, giving you advice, um, really listen to it. They're, they're, you know, really listen to it and say, what, do, what does this mean to me now? What does this mean to me in the future? And be sure to listen to it. And that happens when you're in school and it happens when you get out of school. So always, you know, keep your ears open and, you know, it kind of goes back to what, what Mitch said about, you know, when you, when you have, um, you know, when you have opportunities to take on a new challenge, 
you want to really think through what you did well and what what you need to what holes you need to plug or what sometimes we call flat spots what flat spots you need to plug in order to do the job well and you know whether you're taking over you know secretary of the air force or you know I- any of us that the things that we do you, you have to figure out what do i need by the way what do i need to move fast because i think that's one of the elements in today's world when you take a new job you don't have 2 years to come up with an action plan and you need to really go into it and say i'm going to you know define the job figure out what needs to get done get the right team together boom 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 um but you guys all have a lot more experience at some of those things than I do. You know, France, when you take over, you know, when you stepped in to head up the foundation, you know, what, how did you think of it in like your first hundred days? Well, they, they were, they were pretty rough days. Uh, I got handed a list from the chairman of our uh, authorization committee in Congress that had uh, the, uh, a list of 20 grants that uh, he said the National Science Foundation had awarded that he thought were just junk stuff and what we were gonna do about all the junk in our portfolio of tens of thousands of grants and and uh, and he was gonna publish them in a waste book. And so, I, I, and, and, and there were a lot of other things. There's something called an inspector general of the agency who gets on you for management challenges and, and how you run big, large facilities and so on. I, I have a whole list of them that I, I give talks to young people about how you how you uh, confront challenges. But you know, we just had a great team coming back to the theme that's been said here so much. We had a very collaborative, inspired, uh, motivated team. And we just all got together. I think the key thing was saying that we're, we're not going to ignore this. It's like when you ignore a bill that's on your desk, you know, nothing good happens when you ignore that bill. So you got to confront it. And sometimes when you confront it, like I, I did just a week ago, it it, it vanished, the bill vanished because I confronted it and challenged the, uh, the, uh, the, the person. Um, so it's, um, we, we confronted with good, good spirit, a spirit of engagement, uh, our challenges. I engaged with uh, a Congress and the naysayers, visited every one of them, you know, tens and tens of them, a hundred and more of them. And we uh, engaged with all our uh, auditors and our oversight people and stuff. And they actually thought it was great that somebody was not just saying, oh, you're, you're not making sense, nonsense. We, you are, um, you're, uh, you, you, you want to listen to us hear what we have to say about what, what we think your, your agency is not doing at this moment. So every one of our challenge, just including we had these so-called significant deficiencies. I think you all are aware of what <laughs> those kind of things are, but we got rid of them. And for the my last three years, for the first time in like forever, decades, we had no significant deficiencies. We had the first agreement in 40, year, 40 years, our agreement, a collective bargaining agreement with the union. These are all things that to the students probably are not recognizable words, but if you're going to manage something and lead a discovery-based institution, you've got to get your house in order. And so you can't, it's just like your own home here. You, you know, you can have a beautiful garden, but if the house, if those little pillars on the house in the background, that's my house, were falling over, you, you better get somebody to shore them up. And so, uh, you know, that's, that's how we confronted our our challenges is just by facing them. Nothing is changed unless you face, you know, face it. Debbie, I would add to what Francis said. And first I would like to say, no one does it better than France Cordova. And she has taken on the challenging projects and she cleans it up, she makes it right. And she, that reputation that we heard about She's earned that by doing great things throughout her career. Maybe that's a little bit of the Caltech in her, but uh, France Cordova is just a champion among champions and I'm, I'm proud to consider her a friend. And I think Caltech should be proud both of her alumna status as well as her uh, leadership as a, as a relatively new trustee on the board. In my case, the challenge was setting up a space force. How do you take legislation and overnight create 
a space force to, ch to meet some of the challenges that we have uh, in a very sophisticated and unforgiving environment. Uh, and moving fast is not especially the expertise of, of government. Um, but the only way we will be successful in defending America's dependence upon space, which is everybody's every day, uh, is to move with alacrity. And so you communicate, you plan, you execute, you communicate some more, you move out, you get it done, and you, um, and, and you continue to communicate in order to keep people apprised of both the challenges and the, and the successes. Um, and, and I think that's, uh, and then it's especially rewarding when you feel like you're, you're making big progress on something that's important. That's great. Well, I wanna thank all of you, Mitch. How would you like to summarize our event tonight? Well, here we go. Um, so I, I actually uh, think there are some recurring themes that we've seen here, which uh, have license across many of the questions. I think figuring out your values and who you are, because it's gonna inform the types of jobs that you're gonna seek. It's going to inform who your life partner is and whether you have uh, similar ambitions. Um, as Anne said, ask your friend who your, what your superpower is because they're more likely to be able to tell you with some precision that you can't. Um, your values uh, about what you're prepared to tolerate in seeking your own work-life balance is gonna come down to, okay, let's look at me, how, what, what is important in my life. I think it also speaks to um, what Barbara said about knowing your own worth and where your greatest value is to succeed in a male dominated environment. There was another um, theme here, which is be open to risk change and that serendipity when it comes along. Um, as you said, Debbie, don't create your own glass ceiling and it's absolutely okay to shift roles to find the best place where you're gonna thrive and do your very best work. And then the other area I think is about dealing with difficult people or setbacks. And uh, as Barbara said, this is, this is a, a rate of passage, it's going to happen. So you again, need to figure out your toolkit to deal with these things. So those are my three big takeaways. Great. Cindy, do you want to bring it home for us? Sure. Um, hard act to follow, I have to say. Um, we are just so incredibly grateful for these pearls of wisdom. Um, I learned so much in this last hour and a half, and I hope um, the 90 remaining, 88 remaining participants um, have had that same experience. Um, if um, people who have attended this would like information from the Caltech um, Career Development Center, um, please contact them at career at caltech.edu. Claire Ralph, our extraordinary director, is waiting for your email. <laughs> um, and last but not least, um, because Caltech, um, and I know this because it works so hard on accreditation, is now um, very much a culture of evidence kind of place, um, not just with respect to science and engineering, but with respect to these sorts of things and how we're doing and assessing them. Um, there's a very quick survey that um, uh, when you exit this uh, Zoom meeting, um, you will see. And I would ask you to fill it out so that um, Debbie and the other panelists can get a sense of what's been helpful and what you might want to hear more about next time round. Um, so I would encourage you to fill that out. And once again, just please accept my thanks, our thanks on behalf of the Caltech community. This was truly extraordinary and very generous of you. So thank you very much. Thanks everyone. Happy okay. uh, International Women's Day. Great fun. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye all.